Yes, we are recording. We are recording. Well, welcome everyone. Um, as everyone filters through, well, we shall commence because it is 5 p.m. on a Wednesday. Um, today we've got our September slot of the What is Medieval seminar series. I'm not quite sure what number we're at. Are we at nine or are we at ten? Are we at eight? Did we start in February? Yeah, we'll have an extra one, have anyway. Oh, no, that's anyway. <laughs> Probably number nine. As always, do remember that our seminars are recorded. So in case you miss anything or you have to leave halfway through, this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within the next week or so. And we send out all the information via Eventbrite. So don't worry, we will send you the link. And also just to remind you to please put any uh, questions for today's speaker into the chat box, which is just below. Uh, do that throughout the paper, that's absolutely fine. But Claire will also be collecting them both during and afterwards as well. So on to today's speaker, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Renee Ward. Did I say it right there, Renee Ward? Hopefully. Um, Renee is a senior lecturer in medieval literature at the University of Lincoln. Her research interests include the literature of the medieval period, Middle English romance, the monstrous and medievalism, especially in children's literature. Currently, she's working on a book focusing on werewolves in medieval romance and researches medieval outlaw ballads. She's well known for her published work on medievalism of J.K. Rowling's Rowling's Rowling like bowling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Harry Potter series. And today she'll be talking about Arthur's Court and Gothic spaces in E.L. Harvey's The Feasts of Camelot. So thank you. Over to her. Thank you, Emma. And I would like to thank Emma and Claire for inviting me to be a part of this uh, series, which has been um, incredible to watch. I've, I've been watching most of them after the fact. Um, and it's, it's just an honor to be able to share my work. I do feel a little daunted. I, I, some of the presentations, especially those by uh, Andrew Elliott and Kenna Olson have been very multimedia based and very savvy and tech oriented. And, and I feel um, very old school because I'm gonna take us back to text and to kind of reading closely. Uh, but I, and I, uh, I hope that you enjoy the, the, the topic and, in, and then there might be some useful conversation at the end. I'm also working with a couple of screens, so please be patient if I have any um, tech issues, um, but hopefully everything will proceed um, fairly easily. Ah. As I tried, there we go. So I want to begin by providing a bit of context for the presentation. The ideas I explore are uh, part of an ongoing and larger project I've undertaken to recover the works of Eleanor Louisa Harvey, a prolific children's writer well known in her own period, but one also, to use the words of Alan Lupak and Barbara Tifa Lupak, mostly forgotten and neglected by the early to mid 20th century. Born in 1811, Harvey had an expansive and successful literary career that ranged from her early, early 20s until her late 70s, and a number of her works remained in circulation as reprints beyond her death in 1903. Her corpus overall includes half a dozen collection of, uh, collections of poems, short stories, several novels, uh, quite a few original songs, as well as countless poems published in magazines and periodicals. A number of her volumes also include illustrations by some of the foremost artists of the period, including Walter Crane, Kate, Ga C Kate Greenaway, and Richard or Dickie Doyle. I became interested in Harvey because of the text that I'm going to discuss today, The Feast of Camelot, uh, which was published in 1863 and then again in 1877. Harvey's corpus overall, though, draws heavily upon and reimagines a range of medieval sources, uh, she uses Norse saga, Eddic poetry, um, she draws heavily at times on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, she in, uh, incorporates historical materials and saints' lives. Uh, two instances, for instance, of uh, progressive proto-adaptation texts retell her uh, the story of medieval Griselda, one for adult and the other for child readers. Um, she also has an innovative prose adaptation of the Old English epic Beowulf. So despite all of these innovations and adaptations though, she remains fairly undiscussed in scholarly fields and especially those that deal with uh, women writers in the 19th century or children's writers. Um, so over the past several years, I have started to study her works with an eye to the medievalism that she engages in and to the contributions that she makes to the fields of women's writing and children's writing in the 19th century. 
And what I talk about today remains very much a work in progress. Uh, the Feast of Camelot is a complex text and it is a collection of 20 stories overall within a larger frame narrative, so 22 chapters in total. What I hope to share then is a snapshot of her technique and her purpose uh, within this particular text. But before I move into the discussions of the text itself, I think I need to also situate feasts within a framework of three closely related critical terms that inform Harvey's narrative and my readings, the Gothic, the medieval and medievalism. And it seems also appropriate uh, to start here, given that the series that we're uh, presenting all of these topics in is actually considered what is medieval. So that's part of what I'm going to discuss. All three of these terms are multifaceted. I will offer here only a synopsis of each, so keep in mind that these are overviews um, that only scratch the surface of each term's myriad meanings. The term Gothic originally had ties to Germanic tribes, but beyond that it primarily designated certain kinds of architecture produced between the decline of Roman antiquity and the Renaissance. These associations extended eventually to the visual arts, especially to painting, and soon seeped into references to literature too. In its earliest use, uh, Gothic could indicate something as simple as a temporal setting. The Horace Walpole, uh, for instance, added the subtitle, A Gothic Story, to his Castle of Otranto to signal that the story specifically was set in the Middle Ages. However, the term could also signify a certain mode of writing which need not be medievalist at all, one which, as David Matthews puts it, floats free of its medieval associations. Critic Anne Williams suggests that the Gothic is akin to a flavor, and I quite like um, her idea here, a flavor that one can find in any text, uh, in, in any combination of features, which might include the haunted castle, the brooding mysterious hero or villain, uh, beleaguered heroines, ghosts, real or imagined, uh, ambiguously pleasurable terror, as she puts it, and the nostalgic melancholy of ruins in remote times and places, whether they be medieval or not. By the late 18th century, Gothic spaces, uh, dark and mysterious places and uncanny abodes abounded both in medieval settings as well as in more contemporary locales. Famous examples of Gothic spaces deployed outside of a medieval uh, period, for instance, include Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with its uh, vast mountainous regions, with, uh, the Alps or the Arctic, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights with its moody Yorkshire moors, uh, and Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre with the haunted, or so we initially think, Thornfield Hall. These texts demonstrate the term's associations with emotions and sensations apparently opposed to classical reality, uh, now rationality and, and reason as well, and the frequent manifestation of such emotions um, in madness and fear, for the latter fear experienced by the characters in the stories and then by extension the reader. And as these texts also reveal, the Gothic can be found in narratives concerned with different types of transgression, uh, transgression across national boundaries, social boundaries, sexual boundaries, and the boundaries of one's own identity. Usage of the word Gothic to denote temporal setting eventually declines in the 19th century with the introduction of the word medieval, a term derived from the Latin expression medium avum, which means middle age. We know this term first appears in print in 1817, and its usage increases across the next two decades. By the 1840s, the term was clearly in popular use as a temporal marker uh, instead of the Gothic and applied to various art forms. But like Gothic, medieval experienced varied use and had rather strong polarized connotations. In fact, both terms were at times deployed as derogatory descriptors, marking something as part of low culture. They were both also assigned to negative interpretations of the past as signifiers as darkness, uh, of, of darkness and barbarism, uh, tyranny, ignorance, and violence. In such instances, their use separated the past from the present as a period lacking the morality and civilization of the now. And certainly this continues uh, in the 21st century. Simultaneously, however, uh, their use could evoke nostalgic visions of a glorious past world, one which contrasted the industrialized urban reality of the present. This particular view of the medieval was reinforced by the 19th century's revival of interest in the Arthurian legend, 
heralded especially by reprintings of Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, the publication of Tennyson's Idols, and then the works of the Pre-Raphaelites and others. Artists presented the medieval past, even if it was a fictional one, as a time of chivalric heroism, social accord, and stability, a time of innocence and purity. For many, Arthur and his court epitomized this lost ideal world. In both traditions, reimaginings of the medieval as either uh, barbaric or as an ideal world, and in associated reimaginings of the Arthurian legend, artists drew frequently upon Gothic conventions, especially its penchant for those dark and moody spaces. The images on the screen are only two examples, but they certainly capture this pairing. Doré's illustration uh, from his, um, uh, he did illustrations for Tennyson's um, Idols, um, especially has the Gothic with its shadows and its cloisters and, and this kind of power dynamic between the characters couched in this um, darkness. Wyeth's Peep is, uh, is no less atmospheric, although somewhat more hopeful, um, but the two certainly create this, this uh, feeling that we get when we think about the Gothic. Earliest uses of the term medievalism, which were contemporaneous with the appearance of medieval, linked initially to uh, faith. They were linked to the renewed Catholicism highly uh, represented by the high church Anglicanism or what we call the Oxford movement. Here, the term was decidedly negative, recalling the negative interpretations of both Gothic and medieval that we've already seen, this perennial image of the dark ages, a world of superstition, primitivism, and violence. But like its counterparts, uh, this term evolves and acquires other more positive associations. By the mid-century, its use spreads to discussions of neo-Gothic architecture, visual art, and even political movements. Some of the well, uh, most well-known structures in London become associated with this term. On the slide, you can see uh, my personal favorite, the exterior and interior of St. Pancras Hotel designed by George Gilbert Scott, who is also renowned for his design of the Albert Memorial, another example of medievalism or neo-Gothic architecture. Perhaps the most succinct and flexible definition of medievalism, one that divorces itself from this dualism, um, is found in the words of Leslie J. Workman, who played a key role in establishing medievalism as a scholarly field in the 20th century. For Workman, medievalism is the study not of the Middle Ages themselves, but of the scholars, artists, and writers who constructed the idea of the Middle Ages that we inherited. For scholars in the 21st century, medievalism is always a plurality, one um, a force influenced by content, form, and medium. So my, my definitions are quite general, um, but they will serve enough purpose for this presentation. So these three terms then, Gothic, medieval, and medievalism, intersect as much as they diverge. Historically, they appear on a shared trajectory, arriving in our vocabulary at different points, overlapping in meaning, and evolving into myriad forms that can vary considerably. All three, though, operate somewhere along a spectrum that exists between polarized meanings, evoking both negative and positive interpretations of the past. Now, Harvey's text is a form of medievalism, specifically what we would call an Arthurian medievalism. It reimagines both the medieval world and the Arthurian world at the same time. But it is also a text that works deftly with both the Gothic and medieval demonstrating their complex relationship. The feasts has two parts, each dedicated to a particular feast celebration. One is Whitsuntide, the other is Christmas, over which its stories are spread with different narrators for each chapter. The volume's full title, uh, King Arthur's Court or the Feast of Camelot with the tales that were told there, what I've in practice over the past few years just reduced down to the Feast of Camelot and then to feasts, um, immediately makes explicit its participation in Arthurian medievalism. The most obvious Arthurian references um, outside of the title include the frame narrative setting of the legendary feast hall, the presence of established Arthurian characters, including Queen, uh, King, King Arthur, Guinevere, Merlin, and Gawain, and countless others, and its contents, which offer further testimony to the enduring legacy of Mallory's Mort Arthur. Many of the tales in the story are drawn from Mallory's text. 
piece also has, to use uh, Williams' expression, a decidedly Gothic flavor. The text overflows with a range of long established Gothic spaces from a moat and inhospitable locals and locales to eerie religious and domestic structures and uncanny or mysterious occurrences. These Gothic elements are obviously paired with the medieval world, given that the frame narrative in which the stories are told is Arthur's court. Yet the Gothic is also simultaneously situated outside of and contrasted to medieval. And this is what really fascinates me about Harvey's text. She frequently racializes her Gothic spaces as well as their inhabitants, suggesting a congeneric relationship between them. Individuals or groups who occupy the spaces are marked as Gothic and they are innately violent or aggressive. Those who enter or traverse these spaces can likewise be affected by them, often experiencing uncanny events, um, some of which result in illness or madness. In this system, Arthur's medieval court is presented as the epitome of an idealized medieval heritage, one that sits in opposition to other identities, um, spatial, individual, and national, that are clearly marked as other by their Gothic flavor. What I want to explore in the rest of the talk then is the way in which Harvey simultaneously blends and separates the medieval and the Gothic, and how she puts the divergence between them to political use. I'll look at key storylines, two in particular, given that there are 20 of them in the larger text, um, that demonstrate how she articulates concerns specific to the uh, mid-Victorian period, especially national identity and just rule. I'll also consider how her technique facilitates explorations of motherhood and wifehood, juxtaposing the conservative values of patriarchal society with forms of female agency and expressions of discontent about the condition of women. Excuse me. So the most prominent Gothic and rationalized space in Harvey's text is the mountain range. It appears in numerous chapters featured, um, featuring Northern and Eastern regions. The most striking representation of the space occurs in a chapter called The Pilgrim's Tale of the Mountain Voices, a story, a story set along the southern border of modern day Turkey, a region known today as the Nura Mountains, but frequently referred to during the medieval period as the Black Mountains. From the late 13th to, uh, sorry, from the late 11th to the 13th centuries, this area was held by the Latin West as part of the region alternately referred to as the Crusader States or um, Outremer. The Black Mountains were a, a key land-based travel route for pilgrims to Jerusalem. The range and Outremer in general is an ideal medieval setting then for Harvey's story and for the Gothic. Surrounded by the Islamic empire, the region is a liminal space, a site of conflict, but also one of cultural contact and exchange. So Harvey's narrator, the pilgrim, recounts the tragic events of a, a, a tyrannical ruler from this region who murdered his former king during a feast, usurped his rule, and attacked and left for dead his successor, a young son. Readers learn, however, that the king's son survives the attack and that his mother puts him into the care of a devoted servant who keeps him safe until he is older. The queen remains at court but plots behind the usurper's back. Once her son comes of age, she sends for him, he returns, avenges his father's death and reclaims his position. Immediately then, the court and the rule of this tyrannical usurper contrast the court and rule of Arthur with the setting of the chapter's bloody events, recalling the larger frame narrative of feasts itself. The medieval feast hall, after all, is a space in which social bonds are created and maintained through the communal meal, and a generous ruler provides for those at his table in exchange for their service and their loyalty. The usurper, a renowned and beloved knight named Talmor, breaks both hospitality codes and vassalage bonds through his regicide and wild slaughter of the king's court, simply because he seeks for himself supreme rule at all costs. This negative characterization of Talmor is reinforced by the parallels established between Arthur and the exiled son of the murdered king, both of whom are sent away in secrecy to be raised by loyal vassals, only to return and reclaim their birthright and an appropriate age. By echoing the details of Arthur's story, the narrative identifies the murdered king as a positive exemplar even before he takes uh, any action in the narrative. Despite this positive framing of the young prince, though, the story's Gothic elements, which are bound up in descriptions of the terrain and its inhabitants, confirm the superiority of the medieval court and his king, of Arthur and his court. 
The narrator details the eerie landscape and events that he experienced en route to Jerusalem, setting an ominous tone. The snow lay thick, high up in the haunts of the white eagle stretched shelf above shelf of barren rock as if the sea of giant waves had flowed and frozen there. The steep hillside was on the one hand, on the other deep down roared the restless flood of a mountain torrent which the ice king had never chained. Clear as the crystal waters was the sharp wintry air and silent as footsteps on the snow. Simultaneously majestic and foreboding, the mountain range is an inhospitable terrain fit for few species. The quiet which blankets the peaks is broken only by the piercing call of the eagle or the rush of the water, while the shelves of barren rock reflect the ferocity of wind as it bombards the summits. This landscape threatens death at every turn. The pilgrim describes the citizens of valleys below the mountain as a strange wild race. When governed well, they are capable of deeds of much nobleness and generosity. But he explains under a hard rule, they become fierce and revengeful and unfor as unforgiving as the space that looms over them. The usurper Talmor's behavior then, especially his wild slaughter of fellow citizens, can thus be read as a natural, expected even, behavior, because it is in step with the violent rush and roar of the mountain waters and the biting winds. Like the landscape, the people are linked to death. The terrain is also the site of unexpected encounters. While crossing the mountain range, the pilgrim narrator encounters a mysterious woman. Despite the silence of the peaks, he hears no sound of approach, yet rounds a bend in the pass to find in front of him a stately woman whose attire and actions mark her as belonging to the landscape. The white of her gown blends with the snow, while the gold and red evokes a royal lineage akin to that of the majestic eagle. Like the landscape, the woman threatens death. Her likeness to the eagle identifies her as a predator, as does the weapon she carries, the death-dealing Yagatan which is thrust into a girdle thickly studded with rich, with rich red stones. The color of the gems appear almost like crimson spots of blood on the snow-like fabric of her gown. The blade itself exoticizes or orientalizes her for the Yagatan, or, or properly, um, I think Harvey messed up the spelling here, the Yatagan is a short, slightly curved sword or blade associated with the Ottoman emperor. It's often referred to either as a Turkish saber or an Ottoman sword or saber as well. Offering the Yagatan to the pilgrim, the woman beseeches him to return it to its rightful owner, the murdered king's son, and bid him be worthy of his country and his race. Her use of the word race here is significant, marking her people as a single entity distinct from the pilgrim's own. It evokes the earlier descriptions of the citizens who live in the shadow of the mountains, reminding the audience that their defining quality is indeed their capacity for violence. Once she delivers the message, the woman melts into the landscape, crossing over the snow like a shadow. She becomes a ghost in the past, an ethereal entity. As the pilgrim continues along the mountain path, he hears a whispered sound that is faint and fitful. Wake the cry for Vladimir, Vladimir the Avenger. Apologies, I have to call. <coughs> Excuse me. This message repeats at intervals, and with each iteration, the pilgrim's blood crept with mysterious horror. He likens the call to the hunter's call, only worse, for this was no chase of dumb mountain prey, the cry was for human blood. Each succeeding cry, he continues, was more hellish than the last, and the majestic range he traverses shifts into a hellish realm. Verily, he declares, it seemed a demon land, where even the mountains cried aloud for blood. Landscape and inhabitants are one, intrinsically bound in a desire for vengeance. When the pilgrim finally comes through the mountain pass, an elderly man explains that the voices are in fact a part of a messaging system that exploits the region's topography uh, and that Vladimir, the son of the murdered king um, and the intended result of the, of the Yagatan has actually already made it through the pass ahead of him um, the pilgrim is astonished, asks, how is that even possible? I didn't pass anybody. And, and the, uh, the old man says, well, he used a second lesser known path. So he shows um, Vladimir's intimate and superior knowledge of the terrain because he has knowledge about these extra passes or uh, gateways through the region. 
But it also shows that um, Vladimir, like his mother, is a harbinger of, of death without even the blade that his mother has bequeathed the pilgrim to and um, entrust to her son. Um, he has, the prince has made it through the pass, has slain Talmor and reclaimed his rule. So all of this happens um, kind of off screen as it were, and the, the pilgrim only discovers it once he arrives at the other end of the trail. So throughout feasts, Arthur operates as a type of interlocutor, providing moralized responses to the tales, commenting upon their quality, upon the quality of the characters of the stories and upon their actions. Through Arthur, readers are gently instructed in what constitutes appropriate social and moral behavior. And this chapter or story is no exception. Arthur's commentary at the end of the Pilgrim's Tale confirms how his court and the audience should interpret the events and the people of the story. It is a sorrowful thing, he says, that a people who, as you say you can bear witness, are capable of more noble and generous emotions should cherish for years a thirst for vengeance such as you describe. A chivalrous race would have rallied round their sovereign lady on the instant and put down the usurper. The wrong was a great wrong, doubtless, but such hoarded and unsleeping hate was wrong too, a sin against the justice of God, unknightly and unchristian. As seen, the usurper is juxtaposed to Arthur through both the feast setting and his tyrannical rule. The young prince, while initially aligned more closely to Arthur, is also set apart by the violence with which he reclaims his throne and the delay in that event actually happening. The people of his kingdom are ultimately seen as wanting, both behaviorally, they are unknightly, and spiritually, they are unchristian. But the congeneric relationship between the land and its people is immutable, and here it manifests as racial and cultural difference, while the juxtaposition of the two courts, their rulers and their realms, reinforces the superiority of Arthur's moral example and rule. So Harvey uses the Gothic elsewhere too. And the other example I want to talk about um, is in, it concerns the South. She links the Southern climes to the Gothic, expressing, uh, expressing again this congeneric bond between land and people. Here, the emphasis is on the Mediterranean, specifically in this tale or example on Rome, which features in a story that unfolds under, over two chapters, the Old Knight's Tale, The Lady's Secret, and the Roman Minstrel's Ballad of Gabrielle of Gaul. The Old Knight tells his listeners about Gabrielle of Gaul, a lady of noble race, who travels to Rome upon her doctor's advice in hopes that the warmer climate will restore her health. Once recovered, Gabrielle meets and becomes engaged to a young man, Lorenzo of Este, and one moonlit eve, she heads out to the nearby cathedral to give thanks for her health and good fortune, wandering slowly and admiring the beauty of her surroundings. When she arrives, it is late and dark, and the old domed church is silent and solitary. Her experience in the cathedral, though, drastically changes her countenance. Gabrielle arrives home unstable on her feet. Refusing to speak, she locks herself in her chamber, but a concerned serving maid remembers a lattice that provides access to a gallery alongside her room. She climbs up and peers in and witnesses a terrifying sight. There knelt the once joyous Gabrielle. Down on bended knees before a crucifix, she lifted up her shaking hands, wringing them in an agony of maddened misery. There were no tears on her face, but it looked death-drawn, death-like and drawn. Her eyes were wild, her tresses unbound, her voice gave no sound, her very prayers seemed to have died upon her lips. There she knelt, rigid and motionless, save for the ringing of the clasped hands, lifted and wrung, wrung and lifted again in dumb, hopeless supplication. Gabrielle's pallor, wild eyes and unbound hair render her simultaneously specter-like and animalistic, while the repeated ringing of her hands gestures to her highly agitated mental state. Voicelessness increases her alterity. While she slowly improves, she never returns to her former health and beauty, and readers are left to surmise that the space of the cathedral, its empty and darkened aisles, is the catalyst for her transition. The knight offers only one further clue to her mysterious condition, telling his listeners that the sight and touch of Lorenzo of Este now wrought in his bride a visible uh, shudder, and that she eventually puts off their nuptials. These scenarios are bound up in the narrative's depiction of the Mediterranean setting. 
Gabrielle's inter, uh, initial identification as of Gaul marks her as from a region more aligned with Western Europe than with the South, while her identification of as a noble race places her on equal footing with Arthur and the citizens of his realm. Her trauma occurs, however, in a community marked by difference. Sir Bjorn, one of Arthur's guests, describes the manners of the South as passionate, impulsive. As with the mountainous regions where weather and terrain have a direct link to the inhabitants, the heat of the Southern region is expressed in the nature of its citizens. The old domed church extends this connection to faith as well. Although Catholicism is never directly mentioned, references to the cathedral and to the old Roman land are enough for an informed reader and most Victorian readers would be able to make this connection um, because of the obvious associations. Rome is the seat of the Vatican, the core institution of the Catholic faith. The narrator then positions Gabrielle and thus Arthur in his court as the more temperate read Protestant race and the Romans as uh, the Catholics as the people governed more by excess and in extremes. The second part of the story confirms this relationship as it reveals the source of Gabrielle's trauma and change. A Roman minstrel performs a ballad which supplies the missing pieces of her story. The ballad's second part describes a scene set three years after the couple's initial parting in which Gabrielle journeys to visit Lorenzo to gaze upon him once more and die. The secrets she has carried since that evening in the cathedral are costly. They have worn her down spiritually and physically, leading to her eventual demise, her death. She recounts, she recounts the events of that fateful night, speaking for the first time of what she witnessed. On the steps where he prayed at the altar way laid, a priest fell, dabbled in gore. And the guilty brand in his red right hand, yonder lord of Este bore. Gabrielle keeps the secret that Lorenzo murders a priest, but doing so is utter torment. She lives in fear for her own life, knowing that her fiance is capable of such violent acts. Through Gabrielle's story, the Mediterranean Rome specifically, and the space of the cathedral are linked to excess emotion and to death. Um, so first the priests, and then of course her own. Indirectly, these associations then encompass the faith systems as well. So Harvey deplo deploys the Gothic to present the East and the South as racialized topographies. These strange and unsettling landscapes or uncanny abodes, whether it be inhospitable mountain range or darkened cathedral, demonstrate a congeneric relationship with the individuals or groups who inhabit them. The excessive emotions or behaviors of the people, especially violence, reflecting the conditions of the landscape. Collectively, they give rise to bloodshed, trauma, and in Gabrielle's case, madness even if it's a temporary condition. Harvey's deployment of the medieval and the Gothic serves several purposes. Most obviously, the distant lands and people are marked distinctly as other by their connection to the Gothic, and they sit in contrast to Arthur and his court. Their constructed cultural and racial difference provides a counterpoint to the heroic codes of action and harmonious and stable governance idealized in Harvey's retelling of the mythological medieval king's rule, which upholds the latter as the pinnacle expression of just civilized and Christian society. This connects to broader contexts in the mid 19th century linked to the construction of a national myth or history appropriate for Victorian culture, one that elevates the position of Britain, um, the British empire on the global stage. The 19th century, much like the 14th century, was a period of immense social, political, and technological upheaval. As Stephanie Barzuski notes, this change threatened to sweep everything familiar away. In response, Britons turned to the medieval past, which seemed to possess the comforting security their own world lacked. Stories about Arthur provided a venue that could consolidate and perpetuate idealized Victorian values. They almost simultaneously reflected the world around them. The idea of empire was paramount in the mid-century period, embodied best perhaps in the Great Exhibition of 1851, which sought to narrate an understanding of the nation as one of brilliance, breadth, and diversity. Harvey's selection of the newer mountains for one of her stories also speaks not just to the region's medieval associations, but to contemporary concerns and events. Britain's participation in the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856 saw it allied with France, Sardinia, and the Ottoman Empire in a contest for control over the peninsula with Russia. 
Setting the story in the Black Mountains reinforces the supremacy of Arthur's rule and thus Britain's in a period in which various empires are battling for global dominance. Arthur's reading of the people of the region as both chivalrous but also unknightly and unchristian evokes the power dynamic of the Crimean War alliance with the Ottoman Empire uh, in strategic decline um, over that period and as the British Empire at its peak. The setting and tone of Gabrielle's story likewise has contemporary connections reflecting especially the anti-Catholic sentiment that despite the Emancipation Act of 1829 still permeated much of Victorian culture. So her Arthurian world is very much um, a construct of the past, but also a reflection of the present. One further contemporary context propels much of Harvey's work, women's experiences. While her text clearly positions Arthur as an exemplary ruler and in doing so perpetuates the gender dynamics of patriarchal systems, she simultaneously suggests that these systems and the men that wield power within them must be held accountable for their actions and their direct impact upon the condition of women. Her text thus engages with the tradition of the female Gothic, frequently foregrounding female figures and perspectives as it critiques patriarchal structures. The Pilgrim's Tale of the Mountain Voices demonstrates the costs women face when ambition and pride govern the actions of men. Talmor, the usurper, usurper's actions result in the queen's loss of her husband and son. Yet the queen demonstrates considerable agency, becoming a catalyst for the restoration of rightful rule in her kingdom. She outwits the usurper by hiding her son, and her appearance in the mountain pass triggers the events that return her family to power. The queen also retains her supernatural qualities, even as those initially attributed to other uncanny events of the tale are rationalized. As I mentioned earlier, Harvey demystifies the uncanny voices that send shivers down the pilgrim's spine, as well as um, how Vladimir makes a speedy passage across the inhospitable terrain. She does not, however, rationalize the mysterious nature of the mountain queen. When the pilgrim expresses astonishment at Vladimir's passage through the peaks, he declares to the old man, no foot save mine has left its track on the snow. Now this conversation concerns the prince's passage, but retrospectively provides further details of the queen's presence. Readers know that she stood before the pilgrim on the very same path he traveled, and that her direction of travel suggests that the pilgrim should have in fact encountered her footprints in the snow as he progressed. The queen's sudden appearance and disappearance already unsettling become even more uncanny if she leaves no trace of her passing. Readers are left to wonder if the queen is ultimately an apparition, um, he has concerns about that initially, or if more eerily, her link to the natural world is so deep that she not only resembles, but perhaps is the eagle that haunts the peaks. Gabrielle of Gaul likewise experiences trauma because of her actions, um, or because of the actions of men, but her story provides a counter narrative too. While Gabrielle's silent state, Gothic in both its style and its origins, evidences her trauma, it functions at the same time as a site of resistance. The protagonist's rejection of her fiancé in the institution of marriage, her refusal to utter wedding vows, undermines the ritual that creates family order in and through language. Gabrielle does not fulfill the role of the helpless victim acquiescing to patriar patriarchal power, nor is she rescued from oblivion by either a reformed Lorenzo or an alternate suitor. Instead, she makes choices concerning her future and lives, or more aptly dies, with those choices. And while she suffers, she eventually vocalizes her trauma, firmly placing responsibility with the appropriate individual Lorenzo. Through her story, Harvey offers a subtle critique of the social structures and institutions that demand silence and obedience of women, whatever the cost. Gabrielle's vocalization of her trauma is of particular importance for Harvey. As mentioned earlier, her story is told over two chapters. The first chapter is a prose narrative, and the second chapter is actually in verse. The emphasis in the latter chapter on dialogue between the characters allows Gabrielle's voice to be heard, providing a contrast to the prose narrative of the previous chapter, which describes Gabrielle but presents her solely as an object that is gazed upon by other characters. Um, so remember um, the emphasis on her beauty or even this moment in which the serving girl looks into the window and sees her. So she's always subject to the gaze of others, including the reader. 
When Gabrielle visits Lorenzo, her purpose is not for them to reconcile, rather it is for her to speak, to give voice to the traumatic act that she witnessed and to make clear to their perpetrator the cost that she has and continues and will ultimately pay for um, you know, with her life. She explains, I am wearied and weak for the truth that I speak and tells her audience one other can answer well for the witness of blood, placing the blame clearly with her former fiance. The second part of her story, the, the part in which Gabrielle speaks is visually marked as different from the rest of her narrative. In fact, it is visually marked as different from all but one other chapter of Feasts. Harvey deviates from her prose form in only one other instance during the chapter that reimagines the story of medieval Griselda, here re, um, reimagined as a character called Gwenelda of Wales. Griselda's story, which remained popular in European countries in the post medieval period, was particularly attractive to many Victorians who valued its presentation of the ideal woman as patient and obedient. Harvey's various retellings of this tale, um, I've uncovered three so far, two in addition to the one that's included in Feasts, resist and condemn versions by male authors in which Griselda remains voiceless and passive. Um, one of her poems, um, well, two versions of it, are, um, to my knowledge, the only account of Griselda's story in Griselda's voice and Griselda's perspective. So Harvey's choice to link the stories of Gwenelda and Gabrielle through her use of the poetic form grants their stories and the messages they contain primacy of place in her collection. Despite the Arthurian frame um, and despite the narrative's focus on what appears initially to be about empire rule, um, all of these other things, it is the two experiences of these women to which she ultimately draws the reader's attention. So Harvey's blend of the medieval and the Gothic crafts a complex narrative that speaks to a range of social and political concerns, including national identity and just rule. And her text contributes, of course, to the mid-century practice of nation building via the Arthurian myth. In the Feast of Camelot, the Gothic manifests both as a type of racialized topography and as a state of being, ultimately contrasting, um, creating a contrast between the idealized medieval world of Arthur, his rule, his court, and his kingdom, all avatars for England and Victorian rule, and foreign lands and people, embodiments of those beyond the borders of the empire. Yet Harvey's blending of the medieval and the Gothic also facilitates explorations of the condition of women, with an emphasis on the key social roles of wifehood and motherhood, ultimately juxtaposing the conservative values of patriarchal society with forms of female agency and expressions of discontent about the condition of women within traditional structures. The stories um, within the collection therefore subtly and sometimes not so subtly demonstrate that no matter how ideal Arthur's rule and realm might be, the patriarchal systems which underpin his world inevitably have negative consequences for women. Thank you. And I, oh, my screen is no longer maximized, I apologize. <laughs> I, if you just wanna stop share, that's fine, that's no problem. That's great, I will do that, give me a second. Great. Well, thank you ever so much for that absolutely wonderful talk. So a round of applause. A round of, a round of applause for you. Um, now on to questions. Claire will be taking those. So please do pop any in the chat box. Um, and Claire, over to you for the questions. Thank you very much. Um, so we have had a question in from Asa. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm so sorry if I'm not. Um, and they say that they're interested in the evocation of race in the tales of both the Mountain Queen uh, and Gabrielle and its connection to national identity construction in the 19th century. The text seems to refer to medieval ideas about race as being rooted in either religion or climate. How are the modern medievalist texts using the term race? What do they actually mean by this? Race is a concept very much an issue in medievalist art and literature. Can you say more about the, how the idea is constructed, constructed and how it functions in the text? Thanks, Asa, and um, thank you for being here. I'm a, I haven't looked at the participant list, but I'm assuming it's you and uh, Asa Mittman. And thank you for being here because I know how early it is for you. Um, yeah, I mean, this is... I mean, this is why this text is so intriguing to me, right, is because she has all of these different versions or understandings of race. Um, it, 
it's very much a sense that um, she's linking them to the landscape or the climate in wherever she wants to other a group, they become very essentialized, um, being part of the landscape, having this uh, connection to the climate. And of course, for me, that immediately evokes something like Mandeville's travels um, and, and all of these other uh, groups of peoples that are shaped by the climate in his narrative, you know, in which they live. So she's, um, I'm not saying that she's read Mandeville. Um, I mean, even though I know she was widely read and, and was certainly very familiar with a number of medieval traditions, including uh, the Arthurian tradition and, and the Chaucerian text. Um, but she cer certainly is drawing upon this idea that we see in those texts. Um, but she's also, um, in at the same time, constructing this sense of a race that is not necessarily essentialized, that it's about qualities, that it's about the way you act and behave in opposition to these others. So she, yeah, she does both. And, and it's, I'm not used to seeing them happen at the same time, um, I guess is what I would say, right? Is that I'm so used to seeing um, the, the kind of this innate or this um, essentialized version. And then certainly with other examples of medievalism in the period that draw especially on the medieval past as a way of, of nation building. I mean, these are, um, if I can be excused for using the term, these are often, um, you know, up until recently were often referred to as the kind of the Anglo-Saxonism, right, of the, of the past that this idea of, um, the, the kind of the, the myth of the Aryan race, as you, uh, if you will. And certainly King Arthur um, gets at attached to that as do many of the other early medieval people. Um, so, so for instance, that seems to be less of a thing for her. Um, it, it's not so much about a group of people that have formed the British nation, but it's about the values and qualities of this, of this group of people. Um, and one of the things that, makes this clear in the text um, is that across the 20 chapters, the members of Arthur's court are not all necessarily from his court, right? They're, uh, they're not all necessarily British. So she includes characters like Sir Bjorn, who is the one that comments on the, the South as being a place of passion and temper. Um, Bjorn is um, a, a, Dan a Danish knight. So um, there are other people from other parts of the world that meet up and become part of Arthur's court that then become part of this mythological ideal. So in that instance, it's not about where you're from and what your, what your faith might be, um, although they do all end up being Christian. I think that's pretty clear. Um, but they're brought together not through race, what we might think of as the racial connections that we see with these other groups. They're brought together through um, types of behavior, values, morals, ethics, and so forth. Um, so she, like I said, she's, she's doing um, this kind of juxtaposition of the two systems, which is, is one of the reasons why the text caught my attention, precisely because I'm not used to seeing them side by side in a single narrative. Um, does, does that help, Asa? <laughs> I don't have the chat box open. I guess I should open it. Um, uh, yes, you know, I think, I think that there is a follow-up qu question from Asa, but I've, we've got lots of questions yeah. coming in. So Asa, bear with me. We'll hopefully have time to come back to your follow-up question. Um, I've got another question from Howard, who says he wonders how much the uh, racialist topographies that you discuss have human-built dimensions. So, for example, Camelot as an architectural space being contrasted with, with other architectural spaces. And do churches appear prominently in this regard, as well as the elite fortified residences such as castles? Well, what's really interesting about Harvey's depiction of Camelot is that it's actually never described. So in her text, um, Camelot as an entity is actually an ideal, right? It's a, it's a space that is occupied by Arthur's people and we know that they're having a feast, but she never gives us physical descriptions, um, which again contrasts what she does with so many of these other places. Um, the story uh, that I mentioned near the end, the, the retelling of um, Gwen Griselda, the Gwenelda of Wales has this dilapidated castle and a crypt with effigies in it. And, you know, all of the kind of things that you would experience or expect from a Gothic narrative. But at no point does she physically describe Camelot. 
So its construction in the narrative is purely, purely about the ideals that Arthur represents. Um, so it's, it's almost a non-space, if, if that makes sense. It's an intellectual, emotional, psychological space, but it, even though it's understood to be a physical space, it's not described. Um, which perhaps means that it's also maybe unattainable given how much detail she spends describing all of these other physical locations. We get, um, like I said, we get castles and crypts and churches and um, mountain passes that are in, in, uh, uninhabitable. We get um, fens, we get uh, one story set on the, in the marcher, uh, marcher land. So there are places even within Arthur's realm that are described as other through their Gothic trappings. Um, but Camelot itself, is not so and that's actually I had actually not thought about that um, before this that question so thank you because um yeah I'm just kind of like oh <laughs> so thank you brilliant thank you uh, we've got a, a question from Katie who um is wondering if you could say a little bit more about the major influences on Harvey's gothic rendering of Arthurian material so do you think she's drawing on the gothic aspects of the idyls or the earlier female gothic texts uh, like Radcliffe. Um, the passage you showed us with Arthur, oh hang on, where's the rest of the message? Oh yeah, the passage of Arthur as um, interlocutor, I'm not going to be able to say interlocutor, <laughs> reminded me very much of Burke's passage in defense of chivalry in reflections on the revolution in France, so I wonder how romantic her influences are. I hope that question makes sense. Sorry, I was reading. Yeah, that's a really long one, Katie. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, that's that's okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, okay. Sorry, I'm just getting caught up in the chat box, and that's probably not. I shouldn't be looking at it. Um, so Harvey's Gothic. She's. I I haven't gotten to the point where. Um, so part of what I've been able to do with some of our other texts is actually pinpoint specifically her sources. And I, um, for instance, her, um, her versions of um, Griselda, her, uh, especially her adaptation of Beowulf, I've actually had the time to sit down and go through contemporary texts and pinpoint very strong um, connections between them. And, and, I, and so I haven't had the time to do that with feasts and it is a much far bigger text um, so the one thing I would say is that's going to be a much bigger project just in the sense of because there's so many different stories in it, each story might actually come from different places, even though I know that she is pulling on Mallory in a, in a number of places. Um, but what I've noticed in the works that I have have had the time to do that with is that she is very specific about pulling material out of other sources and either um, heavily editing it or cropping it or reworking it in a way that suggests she's widely reading her contemporaries um, and also her predecessors. Um, and I also know a little bit about her personal life and, and she was married to the editor, uh, Harvey Kibble, who, um, Harvey, uh, sorry, um, Thomas Kibble Harvey, who was also the editor of the Athenaeum for an extended period. And, and he edited a couple of other journals. Um, she, so she worked within a very, um, very big literary circle. She was friends with Octavian Blewett. Um, so I get the sense that uh, as an individual and as a writer, she's extremely well read and she's um, really engaged in conversations with her husband and with her peers about this type of um, kind of literary movement, right? So stories that circulate amongst a community. Um, so much so that Lee Hunt does refer to her in his poem about the blue stockings. Um, you know, uh, she gets one of the few kind of tips of the hat that are positive. So in that respect, she's seen as maybe not as transgressive as some of the other uh, female writers in that category. Um, but, but there's a sense that she is extremely well versed. So she's certainly drawing on conventions and I would expect, um, although I may not ever be able to prove it, that she is of course reading some of these other, especially female writers, um, especially people like Radcliffe. Um, and one, she's probably read The Castle of the Toronto. She's probably read The Monk. I mean, there's, there's a strong sense that she knows what she's doing. Um, most of the, the adaptations that I've seen um, in detail where I've been able to look at closely at a text that she's worked with or drawn from, um, she's been very specific in what she does and how she does it. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps, um, even though I can't necessarily say at this point that this story comes from this text or has, is influenced specifically by this. 
But there is one caveat to that. Um, so this is one of the things that I want to do more with, but the story about Vladimir the Avenger really caught my attention because of the name um, and the setting, of course, and the links to the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottoman Empire also pre uh, previously had incorporated um, uh, Wallachia or Romania. Um, so I have a feeling, even though I cannot at this point prove it, that she is somehow working with a, a version of the story about Vlad the Impaler um, that might have been circulating. And it's very definitely a pre-Stoker story, but the setting of the tale and the use of that name in particular, um, the fact that it's a prince, um, that there's blood, like all this bloodshed and the you know, kind of usur usurpation of rule, suggests to me that she has come across something about him and that uh, that has influenced her, her story. Um, I just can't prove it yet, <laughs> but I'm waiting for the day when I can get into the archives and, and you know, um, to actually start going through. She she clearly read a lot of periodicals, um, so I'm I think what I'm I'm anticipating I will find is somewhere in the period leading up to say 1862, um, there might be something specifically that will be important for me. So I need to dig in the archives, um, and and that's just all you know will take time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I've got just a couple more questions to try and get through. Uh, Steve asks, um, were these stories aimed at girls specifically or children in general? Mm. He says, Orientalism is describe, um, in describing females is often something aimed at males, though here perhaps it's simply othering. Um, he also says he loves the style choices you mentioned uh, that she uses for showing the voice of characters over the narrator. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the question. Actually, um, so there's a couple of things about Harvey's oeuvre, if, if you will. Um, it's She's clearly writing in many instances for children. And the, Harvey's Feasts is published, um, it's marketed as a Christmas book for child readers. Um, and it's not specifically, um, unlike some of her other volumes, it doesn't have a preface or an introduction that positions it as a text for children. Um, and, and also it doesn't have a lot of the apparatuses that we might see in other texts where you have you know, black letter, you have images, things like that. So it's unlike some of her other volumes, which are clearly um, have introductions or prefaces, which have many illustrations, which use black letter, which have uh, illuminations or foliage around the chapter headings that are um, kind of the apparatuses design them as medieval artifacts themselves. This text has none of that. Um, so I, I, I think even though it was marketed as a child's text or a Christmas gift book, the lack of ornate decoration, the lack of introduction and everything else suggests that she's very clearly thinking about a mixed readership for this text, including adults and children as well. Um, and in most of her other works, she does make it clear that the text is, is geared towards children. Um, several of her texts are actually dedicated to her son. And she was actually, by the time she wrote this, she was actually also a single parent because um, Harvey Kibble died, or uh, Harvey, Harvey, um, I keep mixing up his name, Thomas Harvey uh, actually passes away. He's, he's been quite ill and he passes away, I think in 59. Um, so she's, um, one of the things that we actually see is that some of her really radical stuff is while they're married and he's alive. And then she actually becomes a little bit more subtle and conservative after he dies. And I think that's because she is a, a single parent supporting herself with her writing. Um, but she also in several places, um, especially in one of her later texts expresses concern about people, um, reprinting her works without her permission. So she's really, uh, she's really concerned about who is reading her texts, but also about who is using them, um, which I think is also really fascinating. And I think, again, links to her status as a single parent, um, earning a living by her pen. That's brilliant. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. Um, so I've got a question from Catherine, who says, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, can you say a little bit more about Harvey, how Harvey locates Arthur in relation to the themes of the medieval, the Gothic and ideas about race. Arthur's history is somewhat fraught as a model of Victorian values containing as it does adultery, treason 
and Arthur's failure to secure a legitimate dynasty. Mm -hmm. um, she also asked a little follow-up question, of, you know, and what is Arthur's ethnicity? Well, as, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think she positions Arthur ethnically, right? Like there's, there's very much um, a, a sense that she spends a lot of time talking about these other races, but doesn't talk about um, kind of Arthur's court as being specifically one thing, right? It is very much um, an amalgam of people from around, uh, from different regions that come together because of this shared morals. Um, so in, in that sense, I, I, I really don't see her racializing him in a kind of physical way or his court in a physical way. It's very much about um, their spiritual preferences, right? They're Christian and about their behaviors. Um, but this, I think, also speaks to um, her treatment um, of Arthur across the volume. So um, one of the things that she has a habit of doing is sanitizing the narrative or reforming medieval characters from the medieval legends that are quite villainous. Um, so for instance, the story that she tells of Tristan, Isolde and Mark um, has none of the kind of medieval problems that we expect. Um, there's no adultery. Uh, there's no adultery between Arthur, um, or sorry, between Guinevere and Lancelot. Um, Lancelot is happily married to Elaine. Um, so there's this kind of uh, sanitization of Arthur's world, right? So the, some of the values that would be problematic, especially adultery, seem to be removed. And women in this text are often rehabilitated. Um, so Guinevere, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about, for instance, um, the Mallory's Guinevere, or even later versions where she's vilified. Um, Guinevere is seen as a very positive character in this text, as is Assault. Um, or is sold as, you know, there are different versions of her name. So in this particular instance, then Arthur's court as an ideal is very much a positive one. It doesn't have any of the, the kind of um, the negative trappings that we typically as associate with Arthur. I mean, I often think about when my students are, when I'm teaching Arthur, and there's a, or a teaching a fantasy text that has a reference to Arthur and they talk about how that's a wonderful thing. And I'm like, oh, but it's not, um, you know, that, that ultimately the other part of Arthur is the, the empire, like the Roman empire, like the British empire, there's this rise and fall that, that Arthur's values in some cases end up being his undoing. Um, and that does, does not exist in this text. What we have is this very idealized world. Um, but I think that that actually serves her well because it hones in on the very specific things about women and their condition that she wants to highlight. So um, even though she spends, like I said, all this time talking about these other groups and positioning Arthur's court in opposition to these kind of other racialized um, regions, um, the thing that actually stands out in this text are these two poems, right? Across the whole collection, we have all of this prose and then these two poems and the two poems are about these women and about what they went through as, um, as mothers and as um, wives or wives-to-be. So I, I kind of feel like um, she puts, a, you know, she, she has this um, dust cover on her text that evokes empire, just rule and race. But when you open the pages and get into the text, uh, the thing that she's actually most concerned about is women. Um, and, and that may be, be why she kind of sanitizes some of this other stuff is right to rehabilitate the female characters in a way that um, is, you know, kind of uh, painting their stories anew, if that makes sense. I, I, I hope that helps. Um, That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we are at three minutes past six, so I'm so sorry if you've put a question and we haven't had time um, to get to it. Um, if you have had to dip out of um, the talk for any reason, do remember that it is going to go up on our YouTube channel very shortly. Massive thank you to Dr. Renee Ward for that amazing paper. Um, I've learned so much and my mind is now buzzing. <laughs> I have, I have a lot of questions that I might, I might email you afterwards. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you both for um, inviting me to speak and for everybody that is here, you know, whether it's um, nine o'clock in the morning or six o'clock at night or later, thank you for um, taking the time out to be here and, and for all of the questions. Um, I really appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and please note our next seminar will be held on Wednesday, the 27th of October. We have Dr. Car Carol Robinson from Kent State University in the USA. And she's talking seriously serious, the absurd seriousness of <laughs> neo-medievalist digital media. Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And as we say, this will be up on YouTube very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.